today we begin the Enlightenment and Revolution. The Enlightenment period is also known as the Age of Reason because they were trying to think things out and trying to find better ways to do things. And that included things like science and government and economy. All kinds of things were, were being improved upon by the Enlightenment period. So it's also known as the Scientific Revolution because there's a lot of things going on with science. Uh, basically, the scientists of the time believed that there was nothing that was beyond the reach of the human mind. And so they would study human behavior. They would study problems of society that people were facing. They also believed that there were <coughs> excuse me, certain laws that governed the physical world. So they were looking at um, the works of Isaac Newton and Johannes Kepler, um, all these kinds of things. And they, they said it only makes sense that there are natural laws, laws that govern human nature. There's laws that govern gravity and, and action and energy. So why shouldn't there be laws that govern human nature as well? Well, from this Enlightenment period, we get, like I said, a lot of thinkers who are trying to figure out better ways to do things. And so we're going to look at some of these different writers and thinkers and what their philosophies were about humankind, human nature, and politics especially. So we're going to start with the English thinkers. Uh, there are two English thinkers that we're going to look at. The first is Thomas Hobbes, and Thomas Hobbes wrote a book called Leviathan. And Leviathan said that, or Thomas Hobbes says in Leviathan, that humans are naturally cruel, greedy, and selfish. That humans need to have strict control because if they don't have control over their lives, if people, someone's not controlling them, they will fight, they will rob each other, they will oppress each other, they just do bad things naturally. It's just one of the natural laws. And so Thomas Hobbes really believes in a social contract that you give up control of government to an organized society. So that, or you give up control of your, your choices to an organized society like a government who is going to control you and make sure you aren't hurting other people, you're not robbing other people, you're not being cruel, greedy, and selfish. And for Thomas Hobbes, he believes that an absolute monarchy is the best form of government because it's a very powerful form of government. Nobody can question the king or the queen. Nobody questions the monarch. Their power is absolute. And so he felt that was the best form of government. The other English thinker is John Locke. And John Locke writes two treatises of government. And in it, he talks about what his thoughts are on government and on human beings. And he believed that humans have natural rights, that they have these rights from birth, that they are given them, that they included life, liberty, and property, that you had these rights of life, liberty, and property. And so he felt that government should be a limited power, that it had an obligation to those that it governed. It needed to do good things for them. And if that government doesn't do its job, then it is the job, it is the, it's, it's okay for the people to overthrow that government. And so John Locke talks a lot about the right to revolution, that pe the people have the right to rev revolute, to revolution, that they can overthrow their government if it's not doing what it's supposed to be doing. So those are the English thinkers. Now we're going to move on to the French thinkers. Baron de Montesquieu writes The Spirit of the Laws, and The Spirit of the Laws, he talks about his philosophy of government and what he thinks government should be like, and in it he talks about the fact that there should be a division of government, that there should be three branches, the legislative, executive, and judicial branches, and that there should be a separation of these powers and they should check and balance each other so that one doesn't become more powerful than the other. Another writer of this time is Voltaire, and Voltaire is going to write a book called Candide. And Candide is sort of this humorous approach of criticizing the government. And in it, he is going to target corrupt officials and aristocrats. Um, he's going to look at the slave trade and criticize that. He's going to make fun of religious prejudice. So a lot of different things. But in the in the course of his book, he is going to not only offend the government, but he also offends the church. And so basically he has everybody upset with him. And it's really interesting because Voltaire was a big proponent of freedom of speech. And 
his freedom of speech is going to be hindered by the church and the government because he writes against them. And so his books are going to be censored and they'll be burned as a result. Another French thinker is Denis Diderot, who wrote, wrote the Encyclopedia. Uh, the encyclopedia was 28 volumes and it took him 25 years to compile this. Now he did not write it all himself. Instead, he is going to solicit uh, leading thinkers of the time and say, hey, you're an expert on this. Could you write me an article to include in this vast collection of knowledge, the encyclopedia? And so he gets articles by leading thinkers and leading um, experts on different subjects. And so that's how he compiles it all together. Now, he also will write several other things as well, and he is going to be a big proponent of getting rid of slavery. Um, he praises the freedom of expression. He urges education for all, not just the rich, not just boys. He, he encourages it for everyone. But he also is going to attack divine right, and divine right is the power that kings had, that it was God-given power, so nobody should challenge them. And so he's going to attack that idea that the the king or the monarch was incorruptible because they had God-given power. So he challenges that thought. The next French thinker is Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and he write he writes he wrote bleh, the social contract. And the social contract is uh, he talks about how people are basically good, but that they are corrupted by the evils of society. And so uh, you really need to to be in a more agrarian society. We need to stay away from each other. Small towns and villages is best. When you get into big cities, that's when people get corrupt. You get th those tendencies towards greed and selfishness. But he also talks about how most people are worried about the general will, that they're trying to do things for the good of the whole rather than for the good of themselves, that in general, people are fairly good about that sort of thing. Next, we have Mary Wollstonecraft, and Mary Wollstonecraft is going to write a vindication of the rights of women. And so in that, she talks about this, um, getting the same education for boys and girls so that it's an equal education. She also says that uh, women should be excluded from the social contract since they don't have any voting rights, they don't have a voice. Why on earth should they have to follow the voice of the government? But she also writes about how a woman's first duty is to be a good mother. And so uh, she needs to be a good mother to her children, but she also should not be completely dependent on her husband because what happens if the husband dies? She needs to be able to support her family because that's what a good mother would do. So all these thinking about government and education and that kind of stuff. So we also have thinkers that are looking at economic thinking and they're gonna be exploring different ideas about how the economy should be run. One economic theory that comes up is laissez-faire, and laissez-faire is a business practice or an economic practice where a business is allowed to operate with very little or no government interference. So the government's not mandating that you need to do this and you need to do this and this and this. Um, and so laissez-faire was kind of highly liked by business people, especially um, instead of mercantilism, because mercantilism required a lot of government regulation in order to get a favorable balance of trade. Uh, other economic thinkers are going to look at supporting free trade and lifting all tariffs. Remember, tariffs are, are taxes on imports, so things that are coming into your country. And, and they felt that, well, if we had free trade, we shouldn't need tariffs. One major economic thinker of this time is a man named Adam Smith, and he's going to write The Wealth of Nations. And in it, he talks about a free market system. And in a free market system, you obey the natural forces of supply and demand. And you don't have the government interfering in it. It's the people, the population that determines prices and determines the supply and, and all that kind of stuff. Um, but he's also going to, in his book, talk about how manufacturing and wages and profit and economic growth are all linked to supply and demand and how those things can affect supply and demand and ultimately um, the price of things. Well, eventually the Enlightenment is going to spread to other areas of the world. Um, educated people are going to read things like Diderot's Encyclopedia as well as uh, these little pamphlets that they produced for really cheap 
amounts of money um, reflecting the other people's ideas like uh, John Locke's or Thomas Hobbes. They'll, they'll reprint part of their books in these little pamphlets. And so these ideas are going to spread about how, you know, maybe we need to rethink our government. Maybe we need to look at it and, and maybe change it to work better. And so um, they're going to exam examine things like divine right. And divine right is going to give way to a more just society that is going to ensure um, the well-being and social justice and, and happiness of the people as opposed to divine right of kings where they really could care less what the people are. As long as they're happy, they don't care what the people are. So that's going to make some major changes. Well, the government and the church are not really happy about this. And they felt it was their duty to defend the old ways because that's what was set up by God. And so they're going to be big on censorship of censoring um, these books and pamphlets and they'll ban them and they'll burn them. Um, and so a lot of political writings are going to be disguised as fiction, like Candide, which was written by Voltaire. It's actually a fictional piece of work. It's not a political writing, but it is underneath the surface. If you know what you're, you know, what the, the, the code phrases were, you could understand, you know, what he's trying to say in his book. Also, ideas are going to spread in these little informal gatherings called salons. And these salons were informal little gatherings where writers and artists and philosophers and politicians and, and people are going to come together to exchange ideas. Now, the salon originated in Paris. It was actually set up by wealthy women because, you know, their husbands were highly involved in this and they wanted to be able to talk to their husbands. So they are going to invite these men so they can get more educated because remember, women were not highly, ed highly educated at this time. They weren't encouraged to be educated at this time. And it gradually, because the wealthy women were doing it, the middle class women are also going to want to do this because it gives them a feeling that, you know, they're just as good as the wealthy women. They also have their own salons. The most famous is going to be a, a woman named Madame Joffrin, and she sets up her own salon after she had attended one at a friend's house. But again, it, it, it's so that they can learn to talk about and they, they can be educated about the things that were going on in their community and in their society that they probably would never have had exposure to before. So because all these people are meeting together and talking about things, not only is government going to be influenced, not only is the economy going to be influenced, but arts and literature is also going to be influenced um, as they see changes taking place with this. There are two major styles that are going to come out of this time period of the Enlightenment. The first is the Baroque period, and the Baroque period is a very complex style. It's very heavy, very ornate, um, huge, colorful paintings, lots of gilding, um, kind of a, a heaviness feel to the artwork and, and, and the decorations. Opposite of that is the Rococo style, and the Rococo style is much more refined. It's it's elegant, it's charming, it, it talks about, or not talks about, but it, it depicts like flowers and shells, seashells. So very delicate lines, delicate colors, all that kind of stuff. And so these are two styles that are embraced by the wealthy because they're the ones who could afford it. The middle class, for the most part, didn't have all these frills. If they had a little bit more money, they may spend it on a few pieces, but they're not going to go all out the way that the wealthy do. Um, most of the time, they're going to focus on like family life and, and realistic towns or country scenes, things that they're more familiar with, things that seem more personal to them. Music is also going to change at this time. Um, we'll see ballets and operas being performed, um, but they are very ordered, they're very structured. So we see that kind of coming through there as well. Um, famous musicians like Bach, who was a German, he's going to write very complex religious works for the organ and for choirs. Uh, Mozart, who was a composer and performer, and he also will have a variety of music like operas and symphonies and religious music, all kinds of stuff. Novels will start to be written, and novels are long works of, of prose, of fiction. And the middle class liked these stories because typically there were stories about 
their own time period. So it wasn't like they had to remember facts from history and and read between the lines and all that kind of stuff. They were they were books from that own time their own time period that they could relate to. A good example would be Robin, Robinson Crusoe, which is written by Daniel Defoe, and it's about the shipwreck that takes place, which common occurrence because of all the trade that was taking place. And so um, it's how Robinson Crusoe is able to survive on this island and, and eventually get rescued. Britain will also eventually experience the Enlightenment. And it's kind of interesting because Britain becomes this huge global power, even though it's a very small island kingdom. It's not big at all, but somehow it basically controls the world at the at, at its height. Um, the reasons why it becomes this global power. The first is that um, geography plays a big part of it. Um, because they are an island nation, they have a very strong navy. And they actually have the best navy in the world at this time. And so they're able to control trade because they can control their locations. And they had outposts around the globe that they're able to uh, take control over and, and uh, get money from, all kinds of stuff. So that helps them. The second is that they're very successful in war. Part of that is because of their navy. Um, when they had victory, they got all kinds of rewards like land and resources. Now they had a very small army, but they did have a huge navy and it was the best navy. So very, very powerful, very, very strong at this time of where transportation is very heavily dependent upon ships. Their business climate was also very unique because they had very few restrictions on trade, but also because their nobility, their upper classes, would engage in business. And so you get a lot of a lot more investment that way. Whereas in the continental European countries, they were kind of snooty about it as, I don't want to get my hands dirty. I'm not going to do this. And so you, they don't participate in business and they don't get the investment in European countries, the continental European countries, the same way they do in Britain. In, in Britain, there's much more participation, so they actually become much more successful that way. Eventually, they will have a union with Scotland, which is going to be an economic advantage to them because trade is going to pass freely. And then Ireland is also going to be controlled by the British, and that land is going to be taken over by the British and the Scots, which is still in high contention yet today. But um, it is very beneficial again to them because of the resources and land that comes to them. Now Britain will eventually establish a constitutional government which was very unique for the time and a constitutional government is one whose government is whose, a government whose power is defined and limited by law by, by the laws that are passed by Parliament. Now, their constitution is not a written document like ours is. We have an actual written constitution. They don't have a written constitution. Instead, it's made up of all the acts that are passed by parliament over the years. So it's like every law that has been passed is put into a book, and that's like their constitution, but it's not really a constitution. It's just a com compilation of all their laws. Eventually, in Britain, we'll see the, the development of two political parties, the Tories and the Whigs. And the Tories were very conservative. They were made up mostly of the landed aristocrats. Um, they wanted very broad royal powers that the king would have a lot of power and that the church would be very dominant. The Whigs, on the other hand, were very liberal and they tended to be more of the, the business merchants and those kinds of things. They were in favor of the parliament having more power than the crown and um, religious toleration as opposed to dominant church. So we're going to see how those will interact in the future.